This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting the show is Susan Metzger, Director of Strategic Interdisciplinary Program Development at K-State, to discuss the Kansas Water Institute. She says how people around K-State and Kansas will be working together. K-State Watershed Specialist Herschel George and Stacy Minson continued the show talking about the water handbook that will be coming out soon for producers to use. After 11 years, the USDA plant hardiness zone map has been updated. K-State Nursery Crop and Marketing Specialist Cheryl Boyer completes today's show by discussing map changes for Kansas and what they may mean for gardeners. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show discussing the Kansas Water Institute with the Director of Strategic Interdisciplinary Program Development at K-State, Susan Metzger. Susan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me today. Susan, as we talk about the Kansas Water Institute, what is it? Well, the Kansas Water Institute was officially launched earlier this month. And it's a university-wide institute that brings together multiple disciplines to tackle water-related research, teaching, and engagement, all with the aim of addressing our state's highest priority water resource challenges. And K-State used to have the Kansas Water Resources Institute, and so is KWI kind of taking that over, or how's that working? So under the 1964 Water Resources Act, every state and territory has a Water Resources Institute. It's funded through the U.S. Geological Survey. So that's always been housed here at K-State under that act, uh, but never fully staffed. So we take our resources from the U.S. Geological Survey, and we turn that right back around in the form of awards for grants and outreach events. But other institutions at other states, such as Texas and Oklahoma and Colorado, use that base funding to do really impactful things at a university level. And so that's our goal. We're taking KWRI, bringing it up to the university level, and making it more interdisciplinary, more multiprogrammatic, and better collaborators with our peer institutions. You've mentioned interdisciplinary a couple of times. So what does your team look like for this? So we have a working group that was assembled to really figure out what the Institute's goals and priorities are, what our long-term and short-term structure is. And there is a representative on that working group from every one of our colleges here at K-State, as well as our Salina and Olathe campuses, and even our research and extension stations throughout the state. So it's a truly interdisciplinary, comprehensive group that will allow us to think of how you tackle big water challenges. We know that those challenges can't be addressed just by what might come out of agronomy or biology or sociology. It's going to take all of the disciplines coming together in new and innovative ways to tackle those challenges. And as you're thinking about working together, is this just K-State in Kansas or is there other universities participating in this? There are other universities. So we call it the Kansas Water Institute at K-State. This is our home and And it's a great opportunity to leverage the strength and talent and knowledge that we have here on our own campus related to water resources. But we also know that talent and expertise exists at our peer institutions throughout the state. So we have an advisory group that includes representation from Fort Hayes State University, the University of Kansas, Wichita State University, and Emporia State University. And we can pull all of our resources and talent together to tackle water. So what are a few points or pillars within the Kansas Water Institute that you're hoping to be able to share expertise on? The working group really thought of what would be the best way to organize not only the expertise that we currently have, but how do you pull those together in ways that are actually advancing or addressing our water resource challenges? And so uh, we looked at a number of things, the UN Sustainable Goals, uh, and kept coming back to the guiding principles of our state's water plan. So there's five guiding principles that really govern all of the work and priorities of our state water resources, such as conserving and extending the High Plains Aquifer, being more resilient to extreme events such as floods and 
and droughts. And so our working group really thought those are our best ways to align our talent and resources and effort under those five guiding principles of the Kansas Water Plan, because we know that that will also resonate with the agencies and the stakeholders throughout the state as we stand up the Water Institute. And maybe what are a few water challenges that you guys are hoping to look at first and maybe possibly do a little bit of tackling of? So one of the things that we really learned when we started developing this university-wide institute is kind of the low-hanging fruit. We convened a group of more than 75 faculty from all different disciplines across campus and across Salina and Olathe, and we just started talking about what do we do well so far in water, what are the emerging areas or issues that you want to tackle, and what we learned was that there were relationships that were built just from that workshop by convening people in the same room that have a shared passion and interest and knowledge around water resources, but maybe have never met each other. And so one of the first priorities of the Kansas Water Institute is to keep that momentum of engagement across our faculty moving forward. So uh, one thing we'll see this winter, we're going to launch lunchtime symposium series called Water Wednesdays. The first one will be in January and the second one will be in February. And then we'll have an evening event on March 7th here in town, which will be more of a social networking opportunity. But the idea of those symposiums is to get people together around a really focused water topic. So maybe we might talk about water quality or existing with a limited water supply and take that lunchtime topic, have a couple of flash presentations, but spend the rest of the time just getting to know the expertise that we have right here on campus so we can form collaborations for grant proposals, for teaching, whatever it might be. And as you're thinking about those stakeholders and ag producers, what do you hope this means to them? The most important thing is that the research, teaching, and engagement that we offer is transformational to the decision-making on the ground. So uh, whether that is a community that is struggling to have a long-term water supply that addresses water quality concerns, or whether that's a producer that would like to adopt the latest, greatest technology to drive down their water use while still being profitable. I hope they see that the Kansas Water Institute is the place to generate that research and knowledge and translate it into effective decision-making and tools for those communities and producers. As we look then, Susan, at the future of water, how do you hope the Kansas Water Institute helps to continue navigating the future? One of the things that we think is quite important with our advisory group is that it's not just a, a static institute. Today, under the Kansas Water Plan, these are the issues that we're looking to tackle, but we're also using that stakeholder feedback to really think of what are the emerging issues that we need to prepare ourselves and the science behind it to address in the future. So really looking forward to engaging in the advisory group to keep us nimble and impactful today and into the future. And as established many times, Susan, you love water. And so what makes you excited about the Kansas Water Institute? I do love water. I love talking about water. I love working in water. So the thing I'm probably the most excited about with the Kansas Water Institute is its interdisciplinary nature. And I'm also keenly excited about the fact that teaching is a part of that. So because I love water, I know that had there been a degree available to me when I was in undergrad in water resources or water resource management, that would have been exactly what I would have gone to. So I'm excited to think about pulling together curriculum, whether that's a micro-credential or a degree program that allows a student to really engage in water-related learning that translates into a meaningful career. For people who'd like to find out more information about the Kansas Water Institute, where can they do that? So we have a new website that was launched on our K-State platform. So if you just Googled Kansas State University Kansas Water Institute, that'll take you to our homepage. You can learn more about it. And you can also email water at ksu.edu with any questions you might have. Susan, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some information about the Kansas Water Institute. Thank you, Shelby. That was Director of Strategic Interdisciplinary Program development at K-State, Susan Metzger. I will link the resources that she mentioned in today's show notes on actoday.net. Before we cut to a break, we're now going to be joined by USDA's Rod Bain. Among the highlights from USDA's November World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, the 2 million ton jump in global soybean production adjustment in the prior marketing year, fueled by a projected Brazilian bean production increase of the same amount. 
That should carry over to a record soybean production in the South American nation in the 2023-24 marketing year. And as Don Roos of U.S. Commodities Incorporated told farm broadcasters recently, as among industry traders and brokers looking at this situation... It's all about South America. Between Argentina and Brazil, they raise about twice as many soybeans as we do, to put it in perspective. If they have a problem, we have a problem. However, recent rains after months of dry weather, coupled with increased production from neighboring country Argentina, is expected to limit exports by the globe's largest bean producer. That gained the attention of commodity traders shortly after the WASDI, leading to a market rally. Roos explains the concept of a weather market. Usually weather markets are very fast. They're four to six weeks in length. You're in or out and they're up or down and you get a little bit of a setback. But that's what we're focused on right now. And that's what we're in flat out, a weather market. And I think we'll realize that each weekend as we go forwards. I think this is just the start of it. Broker Tommy Grisafi emphasizes that the movement in soybean markets is standalone from other commodities. It is a soybean rally. It is not a bull market in corn. It's not a bull market. We we have a lot of grain on the world market, and it's going to take an incredible amount of energy to keep that market up. With everything happening in the world, this feels like a gift and an opportunity for American producers to hedge a South American problem. Commodity analyst Mike Zazulo acknowledges while the soybean commodity market rally is a weather-driven one. We, in our trade, have been living off of weather supply-led rallies. Very hard to market market in very hard to control the volatility and the risk management side of the equation. There are also signals and questions whether Brazil has present ability to meet demand from customers such as China. That is due in part to the weather shift of recent rains in several key Brazilian soybean growing areas. That eases crop concerns, yet may hamper shipments out of that nation's port complexes. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we're now discussing an upcoming handbook. And in to talk about it, we're joined by K-State Watershed Specialist Stacy Minson and Herschel George. Herschel, can you tell us a little bit about what is this upcoming water handbook? This water handbook is actually an update of an old handbook that was created about 15, 18 years ago. And uh, what it will do is it talks about uh, the sources of water, whether it be ponds and streams and it also rural water, how we can utilize those and how we can best utilize them with our livestock. So talking a lot about livestock and their water for water quality and water quantity more than likely. And so first off in the book, you guys talk about different sources available. Ponds in eastern Kansas, we use an awful lot of ponds for our primary water source. Uh, streams is, are used as well. And from the water quality standpoint, we really like to keep the livestock out of the stream and out of the uh, pond. And that's the reason that we're talking about uh, the alternative tanks and things of that nature we use. In western Kansas, they use a lot more wells. And uh, where eastern Kansas we don't have near the wells, but utilizing those, whether we're using solar pumps or whether we're using regular AC pumps and things like that for pumping livestock water. So a lot of differences across the state, and the book really then covers the whole whole range of those options then. Yes, and I think the big thing, as Herschel mentioned, providing the alternative water supply, whether we're in the eastern part of the state or the western part of the state, we're still looking as watershed specialists, K-State Research and Extension, to look at the water quality side, how it helps water quality going downstream, and also the health of the herd. So by providing these alternative water supplies, whether we're doing it with wells and fencing off the ponds or creeks, we're giving the cattle that constant clean temperature source of water. And protecting the water supply. Most of the water uh, that goes into a stream and will eventually hit a lake somewhere, and many of those lakes, nearly all the lakes, are using that as municipal water to pump to citizens, whether they're on rural water systems or city water systems. You know, and and, uh, the big thing is water quality. 
And one thing when we're talking about pumping, some people are using solar water pumping, and you guys talk about the different options available to producers. It has been interesting. Over the last years, solar panels used to cost $5 a watt, were kind of a new thing. Uh, nowadays, uh, solar panels only cost a dollar a watt or less, and uh, we can utilize those. Uh, there are commercial companies that sell commercial setups. Uh, there's four or five different primary brands of those. But uh, as watershed spacists, we've been experimenting with using some internet sourced pumps and internet source panels and things of that nature and uh, in here we will discuss a little bit about how to as you would say a DIY type thing how you can do it yourself and put solar pumping system for your livestock together at a whole lot reduced price. And talking about prices that's something that's also included in this book. Yeah we very beginning of it at the very beginning of the handbook There's a water source comparison chart. So we're looking at the source from stream, pond, spring, well, rural water district, hauled water. And then we're going to share with you some of the primary advantages of that type of water source, primary disadvantages. Then we talk about initial cost and then we talk about maintenance cost. Not necessarily in hard, fast dollars because we know right now supplies and the cost of things are changing truly daily. But we want to just do a less to more type of system. So we're using a dollar sign as our meter, I guess, and just letting people see, okay, all of these are on one page. We can compare. Put a relative value. And then they can see, yep, this is an advantage. This is a disadvantage, all on the same type of sources. And as mentioned, it's a do-it-yourself type of project. We will have videos tied to this as well, and there'll be shorter video segments so that you can watch this. Maybe you're sitting in the grain cart waiting during harvest and you pop this up. You can play it back over again so that you'll know what supplies you need and how you can do it, your, do it yourself. Some of the videos we're looking at are maybe winterizing water systems, installing tire tanks, putting lines through pond dams that uh, already have water in the pond, you know, how you can do that without losing all your water. Those are some of the examples of the uh, videos that were getting made. We have some of the material shot for them. We got a few of them that we still need to go out and capture the video. You guys mentioned water quality a lot and something important for cattle. However, that's not the only species thought about in this book. No, there's going to be some discussion in there also on goats and sheep and and, uh, even some wildlife references in there. And is there a mention in there of how much livestock water require at different times of the year, but also different times of their life? What different species may require, but also the different stages of life of, you know, whether a a cow is uh, lactating or whether she's a dry cow, whether it's wintertime or summer. Uh, what the relative temperatures are, they all have to do with how many gallon of water you need to provide for each every day. And there's a part in this water handbook that I find really interesting, and it's a section where you have some frequently asked questions. Yeah, that's one of the things as a county extension agent, as a watershed specialist, there are lots of questions that come in on a regular basis that it's like, how do we do this? What's the benefit of this? One that comes to mind is, okay, I'm going to put alternative water supply in. They're going to be watering out of a tank. But why do you really want me to fence off that pond or that creek or stream? As watershed specialists, we get that a lot. The biggest thing is if cattle don't have access to the water, then we're reducing those pollutants from nitrates, bacteria, and then also the sediment of them going up and down that stream bank. And by fencing it off, we have that advantage that we can still have a water supply for the herd and protect water quality. As Herschel mentioned, that water is going downstream in almost all of our instances, and it it is ultimately someone's water water supply. supply. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier, out west, a lot of the water source is groundwater. But as we go east into the state, we're all running on surface water. So whether it's coming out of a reservoir or a river or a stream, those are things that maybe we don't all acknowledge and realize each day. But we sure want that clean water when we want a glass of water on a hot summer day. Stacy Herschel, you both have spent a lot of time putting together this water handbook. And so through that process, what are a few parts you're really excited to share with producers? 
Oh, goodness. That's like picking which child you like the best. It really uh, would be probably on the uh, installation projects like installing lines through a pond. Uh, I don't think many people realize that you can do it and how you do it. There will be some pretty well step-by-step instructions on how to do that. The section on guidelines for installing a tire tank, they're in there and pretty descriptive so that uh, anybody could should be able to follow those guidelines and have a success at putting a tank in. You can do it so relatively inexpensive if you use your own labor and just go about and do it. We like to provide those guidelines. That's probably my favorite sections. I think for myself, my favorite section is probably going to be these videos that you're going to be able to see, you're going to be able to watch, and then you're going to have the hard copy available as well. The other great component of the handbook is we have a lot of pictures that will be in the handbook. There's also going to be a link on our KCARE, Kansas Center for Agricultural Resources and the Environment Facebook page and on the website. So you're going to be able to go and get a ton of more pictures that as watershed specialists we've collected, we've done, worked with other farmers and ranchers. So I think when you look at that aspect, they're going to see a lot of things that they can make applicable to themselves. And, you know, by all means, reach out to your county extension offices. Call the county agent, say, hey, we want to do a tire tank. Can you help us? We have a lot of experience with county agents. Get them involved. Get them to host a field day for you. That's part of this, you know, mentoring and learning from each other is how we all work best, especially in the world of extension. When this water handbook does go live, where can people find out more information about it? Probably the easiest will be to go to the K-State bookstore and uh, look for it there. You'll be able to download that thing in its completeness right to your computer And you can look right through it, kind of like your old Christmas Sears uh, catalog. Your Christmas wish list, well, livestock producers can go right there and uh, look through it. Get a copy right on their own computer or their phone. I would say the only other thing is, you know, go to our KCARE website. You can find it. Again, Kansas Center for Agricultural Resources and the Environment. It'll be there. And the other thing is these will be available in all county extension offices in the state of Kansas. Conservation district offices in our CS field offices will each be provided with a copy, as well as all of the state watershed um, restoration and protection strategies or RAPS programs in the state will have a hard copy. And they'll be in color, but they'll be able to be printed in black and white as well. That was K-State Watershed Specialist Stacy Minson and Herschel George. In today's show notes on agtoday.net, I will put links where you will be able to find this upcoming Waters and Watering Systems Handbook. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. K-State Nursery Crop and Marketing Specialist Cheryl Boyer says the recent updating of USDA's Plant Hardiness Zone Map is a big deal. The map is used for nearly all aspects of agriculture, horticulture, and natural resources research and extension recommendations. It's also the standard that gardeners and growers use to determine the perennial plants most likely to thrive at a specific location. It's been 11 years since the map was last updated, and Boyer served on a USDA technical review team that helped develop the new map. It was a really interesting process. We were sounding board for them. We listened and provided feedback, and I was able to reach out to our Kansas Extension agents and ask them to give me their thoughts that I could then in turn give to the USDA about how to make the map resource better. Then there was a lot of discussion about weather stations and how they were able to model the data and what resources they were using. And it was very technical and very interesting. There were industry, academia, some other government people, people that were related in some way to use of the map and making sure that it it was highly usable and accurate to the best of our knowledge and the best of our lived experience on the ground. So if it looked like what we felt was accurate for our area, that was great feedback. And if something looked off, they were able to dig deeper. One of the things that's new 
about the map is they have significantly more weather stations this time than they had in the 2012 map. Well, and actually Kansas itself has a lot more weather stations now, too. We do. So there is, there's a lot of citizen science that's happening and, and people who can contribute to that big source of data for our entire nation in terms of more accurate information. Are they primarily looking then at temperature ranges, soil moisture? What are they trying to get from the weather stations? A little bit of all of that. Mostly temperatures are looking at extreme highs and extreme lows and microclimate. So all these extra weather stations have really helped them be able to identify things like urban heat islands and to really get a finer detail with a microclimate so that people can make decisions about what plants will grow and thrive well there. And you know, the opposite is a mountaintop is going to be pretty cold. So they're able to distinguish between those a lot better than they were previously. I imagine that there are a lot of states like Kansas where it is tremendously different from one side of the state to the other. That probably shows up in these maps. Yeah, actually, I would say Kansas is quite a challenge when I try to create lists of recommended plants. The list of rock solid plants for the entire state is real short because you could probably divide us up into at least nine different growing regions based off of heat and cold and wind and soil and elevation and the amount of rainfall each side of the state gets. It's very, very different from edge to edge. The new map is similar to the old in that we do have pockets of zone five in the north, which is very cold. And in the previous version, we had a couple of pockets of zone seven in the southern part of the state, and that range has broadened significantly. So most of the state bumped about a half a zone warmer. And all over the country, broadly, it bumped everybody about a quarter to a half zone warmer with the finer detail. But then there's plenty of examples of people who moved the opposite direction. That does not indicate climate change. The climate change requires 50 to 100 years of data. This is 30 years of data. And essentially, the modeling tools and the algorithms that they use to create it, they're just more powerful and there's more detail and more data. And you can actually go on the map now and type in your zip code and it will give you information inside of a half mile for what your hardiness zone is. What's the real impact? I would say that it's more about being able to try new things that can't tolerate the cold. We have plenty of options that can go colder, you know, so we always have those as options on our plates. But now we can try things that could prefer a slightly warmer climate. We might have great success and we might get to try something new again. So <laughs> it's always gardening and horticulture and plants in general. Trying new things is always an adventure that's fun. That's Kansas State University Nursery Crop and Marketing Specialist Cheryl Boyer. The map and other information can be viewed online at planthardiness.ars.usda.gov. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.